Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jeweler and Jewelers of America's co-branded webinar series. Today's session is hosted by Jewelers of America President and CEO David Bonaparte and me, and features two retailers, Jeffrey Bowling, owner of Jeffrey B. Jewelers in Denver, Colorado, and Bobby Bengivengo, owner of Cellini Design Jewelers in Orange, Connecticut. Before I turn it over to our host to, to get the webinar started, I just want to let our attendees know if they have a question, they can type it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of their screens. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler and Jewelers of America websites this coming Friday, May 26. Now, let's get the discussion started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Michelle. Hello. How are you? Hi. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in with the questions uh, since I already introduced you both. Um, since we're here to talk about diamond buying, I want to start at the beginning of the process. So we're going to start first with um, engagement or we'll call more bro broadly bridal jewelry. We'll talk about fashion non-bridal jewelry later, but for now, Let's start at the beginning of the customer journey. So someone walks into your store, they're searching for an engagement ring. Maybe it's a man by himself, a woman by herself, a couple. Um, when they come in, generally speaking, do they already know about lab-grown diamonds? Do they, do they ask about them right off the bat all the time now? And Jeffrey, I'm going to start with you. Um, yes. I would say about three or four years ago, when we first started seeing the influx of lab-grown um, people would come in, and I think mainly on, mainly on, especially Colorado, on the environmental side, and a lady would come straight to me and say, do you sell lab-grown diamonds? And at that point, I would tell them, yes, I do. And they were like, okay, then we want to work with you. And so evidently, it was something that was on their hearts. And so my thing was to understand why was it so strong? What was it they believed that made them so strong about lab-grown diamonds? And so a lot of times, it was a little bit of disinformation that the natural diamonds are hurting people. There's a bad thing about buying natural diamonds. So then I would want to diffuse that and find out what made them really come in and ask me point blank about lab grown. And then also about the environmental impact. And yes, there can be a smaller footprint of environmental impact with lab grown diamonds, but it's not uh, exact, right? So it's, not a, it's not a zero impact. No, no, it's which not. Which is sometimes so, how they're sold. Exactly. So I, I want them to understand the truth about it. If that's what they want, again, I always like to say I, I don't sell lab grown, but I do provide them for those customers who want them. What do you, when you say, what do you mean you don't sell lab grown? You mean you don't stock them or you don't kind of push them? Yeah, good point. We don't stock them, but also we don't necessarily push them. I don't push against them. I think it's great. I mean, I've been selling them since 1995. We were talking about it, or 1999 with the general. Um, at that time, it was more of a technology. I'm a geeky kind of guy, and I just thought the technology was amazing, um, and I was really more caught up in the technology. Uh, now it's taken on a more, you know, social uh, feeling, a more environmental feeling, and a little bit of misinformation. Um, and I can see where there is some of a threat to uh, the business as usual. Um, but yet, there's a there's a need out there. When a customer comes out there, my go my job is to supply their need of wanting to buy. And I want to, to be the person they purchase from. Um, and so correct education and making sure you give them the truth about it, I think is a way to, to make them be able to sell. Now, before I hand this over to Bobby, I just want to clarify, who do you mean by the general for people on here that might not? Oh, there was the general, uh, the general that actually brought him. The, the name of the company was Genesis, And I was one of the first salesmen for them. And he had found a machine. It's a long story. He found a machine in Russia and he brought it to the United States. And they were manufacturing them out of Dayton, Ohio for a while. And he was really pushing. At that time, we could only do yellow diamonds. So yellow diamonds that. weren't able to get the nitrogen out of it in the machine. But it was early on. So people think that it's brand new. It wasn't. And the whole concept, the general, uh, his, his real push was to make silicone chips. They wanted to replace silicone with lab, with lab diamonds, which would uh, alleviate the heat problem of us trying to cool computer chips down. And my understanding is never really was able to make that work. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. Genesis, and I think that they were trying to move into pinks after they did yellows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that ever really took off. I'm sorry, Bobby, uh, when consumers, yes. customers first come into your store, are they asking about lab-grown diamonds right off the bat? Yeah, so I mean, we've been doing lab grown for about 10 years now. And um, in the beginning, I'm sorry, it was when you something... say doing, you mean you're stocking them or you just have access to? 
So we have them in on memo. I've never owned them, still don't own any of my lab drones as asset. It's all memo, 100%. Um, so when we took it in, we were hesitant at first. Um, my sister and I are third generation owners here at our store. So at the time, my uncle and mother and father were still the owners. And for them, older mindset, my mother especially, because um, she grew up in the business. So for her, when she heard lab grown, automatically kind of went to the synthetic side of things. And when our uh, rep came in and he described it to us, he showed us um, documentation, information, we came a little bit more um, comfortable with it. And so when our customers in the beginning were coming in, it was really more of an educational thing for them. Um, we proposed it as an option to them and just really more of, have you ever heard about lab grown diamonds? And most people would say no. Um, the biggest selling point at the time was probably that it was sustainable, sustainable, eco-friendly, um, and it could be grown in a much quicker time than when it comes from the mines. So I would say in the last three years, it is definitely more common where people are coming in specifically and just saying, I'd like to buy a lab grown diamond. Um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest reason that they're doing it for me, at least today is because it's far less expensive and they're getting a much better quality than they would have normally been able to if they were buying a mine stone. They um, couldn't buy two carat at this level of color and clarity exactly, for right. their budget. In that. And you know, for us, I am never really pushing one way or the other. Um, growing up in the business, the traditional was always a mine diamond. So for me, it's really just more of giving the customer an option and just saying, hey, listen, if you had an idea of what you wanted when you came in and your budget was X. Know that if you want to, you can go this route of the lab grown and you can get a bigger, better quality stone that would either make her happier or him happier. Um, and yes, yeah, so in the last, I'd say three years, we've definitely become more of people are coming in. They know about lab growns. They've done their research themselves and it's what they want but we still do have your traditionalists who come in and they are completely against the lab going and just want the way that it's been for hundreds and thousands of years. And they want just a mind grown diamond. So Michelle, when, Michelle, just a quick oh, question. Sorry. I have a, a kind of uh, follow up to that. So wh where do you see the difference in margin? Um, I know it's different be because of all different size of stones and qualities, sure. colors and cuts. Um, what do you, how does the margin comparison uh, look from so mine for, to, to natural? Yeah, so for, for me to, personally, right? we're about uh, an hour outside of New York City. So I have a very competitive market when it comes to uh, mine diamonds. And I work on a very, very tight budget with my customers. With lab grown, it's the complete opposite. I have the ability because of how inexpensive they are to make a lot more money on the back end. Um, but again, it's it's a catch-22 because the price point is so much right. lower that right. my profit almost kind of balances out to equal. So Dollar -wise, in yeah. one sense, it does make sense where, you know, I can make a lot more money on the lab grown. Um, but I know that's only for me specifically, like people who might be in the Midwest or something that don't really have that competitive market like I do. They're making, you know, key plus on mine stones. So, you know, for them, you know, a $10,000 mine sale as opposed to a $10,000 lab grown sale, there's a huge, huge price difference for the two of them. So for me, yeah, I get kind of more bang for my buck when I sell a lab grown. Um, but that's just more yeah, so sure. because of where I am. Yeah, as far I'm as sure that difference. varies around the country for sure. Exactly, right. Would you say that, Jeffrey? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I have a different take on that in that the lab growns have gotten so cheap now that um, if I'm good at Keystone, on a $500 cost stone, um, that's only $500. If I would right. sell that same stone in $8,000 and get a 20% margin, I'm making way more money. So right. um, I think that's the thing that's really hurting our industry yeah. is the fact that, yes, you might, if you're talking markup, that's fine. Well, let's talk dollars. Right. Dollars as a, as a store who needs to make extra amount of money, you really can't really afford to sell that many lab grown diamonds because you could mm -hmm. sell a whole case of them and not make the money you sold on selling two or three two carat stones at a decent fair markup. So mm -hmm. I think that's the that's that's really the dilemma there. And I think when some of the reporting talking about lab grown diamonds are only you know 13 or 15% of the market, 
I think they're not looking at uh, the now, amount of units sold. So there's the amount of units sold that lab grows are taking up is, is massive, I think. And then, you think it's bigger than 13 to 15%? Oh, huge, yes. Oh, yes. for sure. It represented in dollar amount, yes. It is only 13% of dollar amount, but units, and those units are taken away from natural mine diamonds. Mm -hmm. also yeah, at a much that's, that's correct. I want I want to come back to this question about units in a minute, but before we before we move on, um, when people come in and they you said both of you said yeah they they generally know about lab grown diamonds where are they getting their internet excuse me where are they getting their information and is it is it mostly accurate is it completely inaccurate and I mean I I know the answer is probably the internet probably factors in here but do they get specific about I saw a video on YouTube I saw a reel on Instagram. Is it social media? Is it do, do they get specific about where they got their information and how accurate is it? Bobby, I'll start with you. I would say it's fairly accurate. I mean, I think there's enough information on the internet now where people can do their research. Um, a big chunk of it, I would say, is word of mouth. Um, friends that have maybe gotten an engagement ring in a lab grown that have told their friends. Um, you know, it's, it usually always comes down to, for us at least, the guy and what he's spending. Um, I think the biggest thing that he probably does is when he leaves is he sells, you know, his friends that, Hey, you know, I went to Cellini jewelers and I got a two carat lab grown and I spent this much money. Whereas if I was going to get a mind stone, I would have had to spend this much money for the same size and same color and clarity. Um, so for us, I would say it's really more of internet and word of mouth. That's probably the biggest two things that people are getting their information from. I would say it is pretty accurate we do still have to kind of um educate the customer when they come in because diamonds is its own language jewelry is its own language so it's very rare that someone comes in unless they've done a lot of homework or have been to a few stores already and have kind of gotten an idea of what they're looking for really it's most of the times then the guy comes in or the girl comes in we're starting from scratch and explaining the four c's and going from that point forward Okay, Jeffrey, same question to you. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I don't see a lot of, of, of wrong information. There's a lot of stuff out there, like I've said, that there's a, a lot of information out there. And I think a lot of it is good. Um, but the, the reason why they're asking questions is that they, even though they've been educated, they don't feel good. And mm -hmm. they're looking for confirmation. They want to hear a jeweler say it's okay. And usually they've went into a jeweler said it's not okay. And so they want to they, they want the bigger stone. They want to give her the larger stone, um, but they want to see that it's okay. And they want you to, to show them that they're, they're, they're doing the right thing. And I think it's a very fine line to walk on to mm -hmm. make feel comfortable, but also, yes. again, leave them open the door that this right. is not what our industry is all about. This is something. Yeah. Uh, and I would just say, uh, based on those two answers, that I, I hear that all the time with our members and retailers across the country. I think the most important thing that we've been trying to do as an association is provide the right guidance on this topic. Mm. And what, what I mean by that is disclosure. So um, there was a perception out there early on that perhaps uh, those selling lab grown weren't fully disclosing that they were lab grown. And I, I have not seen that across the board at all. Uh, in fact, I've seen it to the point now where a disclosure is a very important aspect of point of sale, where you are honest and say, hey, this is you know, mind is worth 10,000 same attributes and this is worth two or one or whatever it is. And uh, as long as that customer is comfortable with that and they and the consumer walks out satisfied, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you as a retailer have done your job and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. Bobby, I think you hit on an interesting point and Jeffrey, you both kind of made this point, but I feel like we've kind of reached this point of like information saturation on the internet, right? Like I remember years ago when, you know, the internet was still kind of new, people thought they knew everything by reading like one page on the internet. Now there's so much information out there that people, like you said, Jeffrey, are looking for confirmation because they're confused. And there's so much concern about fake news and misinformation that's circulating. I just think it's interesting how like the internet, now there's so much information that people don't know what to believe and they want to go somewhere. They want to call someone, they want to come in and talk to an expert and say, I read this, then I read this, and then I read this. Can you, I mean, they're confused, right? Mm. It's information overload. Um, I want to move on to my next question, which is now when it comes to engagement rings still, um, which do your customers generally end up buying, a natural or a lab growing? Jeffrey? Which one of our customers? Uh, you know, um, we were seeing a trend of more 
lab than anything. Um, and, you know, just this week, I don't know if they knew I was going to be on this, sem in this seminar, but I've had younger people who come in and have expressed that even if it meant a more included stone or a smaller stone, they wanted mine. And mm -hmm. that is a trend and it's happened probably in the, this year more than yeah. Ever. And I've seen a trend to it and it's, it's, it's really welcoming. Um, but I even had a, a young kid the other day came in and said, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, um, that there is the thing out there lab grown, but I want a natural stone. And he brought his girl in and she said, you know, this is the opportunity to buy a billion, a billion year old item. And when mm -hmm. you have a chance to do that, and I'm like, man, I need you to sell in my store. <laughs> I mean, that was really nice, but um, yeah, I think it's changing and it's changing fast because of the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby, same question, percentage of natural sword versus lab grown. Yeah, I think um, our naturals are still more than our lab, but uh, for us, I will say the labs are definitely creeping up more and more, it seems like. Um, I haven't really had what to Jeffrey was saying, where I haven't really had the younger people coming in more so and going with the smaller natural diamonds. Um, we could just be a little bit behind on that part of things, but um, mine are still our number one seller, but it is definitely something over the last couple of years that was concerning, but more of just like an eye opener that people are definitely more aware of lab drones. They are definitely buying lab drones for their engagement rings. Um, I'd like to see the trend kind of go back towards natural personally, but um, you know, like Jeffrey was saying before, if you don't have them, they're going to buy them somewhere else. So if there is still a need for it in the market, I'm more than happy to supply that to them and, make them happy yeah i see um i was just at the big uh, world diamond congress um in tel aviv and this was a huge topic and to kind of address that uh, the u.s projections for loose diamonds by units for lab grown are going to surpass surpass natural uh, probably within this year mm. in number of units not not uh dollars right. um but it is to your earlier point it can take away perhaps from you selling a natural uh, versus a lab grown for somebody that's buying an engagement ring. We do see engagement ring business. It's a smaller part of the lab grown market. We see this on a grander scale, but it is increasing. The one trend though is, uh, Jeffrey, you hit it before the, and, and so did you, Bobby, the prices are going down. Every day, lab grown prices are going down because of the abundance and the, they're just uh, constantly being produced. So obviously, mm -hmm. Uh, the supply uh, increases, prices go down. Um, we're, we're continuing to see that trend. And that's why I think you're seeing folks coming in to say, you know what, I want a special mind natural diamond. Mm -hmm. um, not that the lab grown is going to go away. You're going to see it shift. It's kind of like the TV market was way back when, when you had these big, huge TVs with the, with the uh, you know, uh, the, the picture tube. And now you've got a nice flat screen TV. The prices went from, thousands and thousands of dollars down to hundreds of dollars in, t mm. in TV market. It's the same thing, uh, right. same kind of comparison. Well, it's a, it's a technology product, right? I mean, it's like, remember the first microwaves? Yeah. Like right. I remember the first time my right. family got a microwave, I think they spent $700 on it. And now yeah. they put their microwaves out on the curb in New York City. When yeah. they and, and, it's, it, and it's created a, a product niche. It's, gonna, it's, it's here to stay. Uh, and you'll see it evolve over time. And it'll be, you know, for those of you who, take it on as a, a viable product and sell it, it'll be another, another product to sell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, I want to talk about employee training in a bit. I don't want to forget that, but real quick, before we move on, um, I want to talk a little bit about the experience. What about customers who are coming in for non-bridal jewelry? What would some would people would call fashion jewelry? So they just want a necklace. It's a self-purchase. Maybe they just want a pair of stud earrings, something like that. Are they, because this is a kind of a less, momentous occasion in many cases are they tending is the discussion the same are they tending more lab grown than natural or how is that working out bobby so for us i mean we really don't do too too much in the fashion i would say for the fashion end of things it's really more diamond studs um and i will say that we do sell a good amount of the diamond studs in lab typically because they're getting even though the quality on them is better than what you would normally see in a natural uh, diamond for a stud, it's more so the size that they're going for. Um, I can remember last year or two years ago, excuse me, we had a customer, older couple, 
very well off for themselves that she wanted uh, eight carat total weight diamond studs and 100% could have afforded them in um, natural. And it was my uncle at the time, his customer, he just explained the lab grown market and how it was kind of a newer concept to here at our store. They weren't really familiar with it, but for her, she was like, you know, I'm at a point in my life and I just want something nice. I don't mind spending $50,000 less on the lab grown than for the natural. And she went that route. Now, at the same time, I do also have plenty of customers that still want the traditional natural studs. Um, but for fashion in general, my customers typically still come in and don't even really ask or think about the lab grown. They're still going for the natural tennis bracelets, necklaces, earrings, and so forth. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a mixture of, I really don't necessarily, we don't really push the fashion as much. Um, maybe if we advertised it more, people probably would be more inclined to come in and ask for it. But it's a small little part in our store that we do have for the occasional person that maybe wanted in studs, I would say more so, or even in like a tennis bracelet, if they wanted something that was a little bit bigger, more flashy, and they didn't necessarily have the budget for the natural, that would be the route that they would go with the lab. Interesting. But uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, for us, you know, we're mainly a custom design shop. Uh, the amount of inventory I have in the store is not, not, not extensive. And so I only stock in store uh, natural diamond pieces. But when you're talking about fashion, a lot of times it's more workmanship and metal. And so in our custom pieces, we've done a lot of lab grown um, in the fact that we're doing maybe a thousand stones or maybe we're doing 500 stones. And so this becomes a big, a big issue. So we've done a lot of lab in fashion, but not in the showcase as much. Um, it just doesn't seem to be that much of a difference in price. And a lot of times, if you're talking about a quarter care worth of stones and a small little pendant and it's 14 karat gold, uh, plus the necklace. I mean, if you add that in, it, the price of the lab grown is, is, is nominal. Um, but when it comes to custom making uh, engagement rings, yes, we're seeing a lot of lab grown diamonds in that in that regards. Um, and when you get into a bigger stone, a tennis bracelets, not so much. Stead earrings, definitely. Um, I don't see that uh, last year we did two carats, one and a half carats, bigger earrings than I've ever done, and they were all lab grown. Interesting. Um, so we've talked both about how your employees obviously explain to customers this is the difference. How did you train your employees? Did you bring in an outside person? Did you use like contract with any companies? And what, I mean, for lack of a better term, what did your kind of spiel, if you wouldn't mind sharing for both, when you say this is a natural dime and this is how you explain it, this is lab grown and this is how you explain it. Bobby? Yeah, for us, um, I think it was our first sales rep that we had when we first took on the line, they came in and really did a training for us um, about when you first started selling lab when we first started selling them. Yeah. Really more so of how you would, um, how you would sell them, how you would introduce them to your customers when they come in. Um, so for me, kind of like what I was saying earlier, basically when a customer would come in for an engagement ring specifically, cause that's really what we sell the most of, they would come in, they would, um, you know, I'm here for an engagement ring. We'd give them the normal spiel about the four C's and looking at a mounting, looking at a loose stone. Um, and then towards the end of the conversation, after getting a more better understanding of what they're looking for, it was really more of just like an introduction. So we had the loose labs in a small section in our bridal section, and it was really towards the end of the conversation, it would be brought up. Hey, by the way, have you ever heard of lab grown diamonds? Oh, no, I haven't. And then we would go into the explanation of how they're grown. Um, there was, at the time, we had a really cool YouTube video that actually would show how one of the growers were doing it from the seed of the mine stone to the rough, to the finish, and then how it comes into our store to the point where we would take them out of the showcase, show it to them, go over the four C's again, and then um, just present the option to them and let them make the decision whether or not they want to go with the mind or if they want to go with the lab grown. And how much in explaining to them, Bobby, did you ever get into like for the natural, like the beneficiation angle, like natural and we get our natural from these countries and this is how it helps people support people in those countries. Did you get into that aspect of it? Because I think we that's something that. that 
I think that's no, something but, that comes up when we're talking about like natural versus lab growing. Sure. And I will say that, yeah, we didn't really get too, too deep into the conversation with our every customer that would come in for that. But there are the occasional customers who were always more curious and concerned about where the natural stones were coming from. Um, with us, we've had a long relationship with most of our cutters and suppliers that we have the ability to let them know where they're coming from, what mines they're coming from, um, how they're helping those um, areas with the people who are doing all the work. And um, that was definitely something that I think that they took a uh, liking to. Um, one of our vendors, we actually could literally go all the way back from the mine to every point that it made until it came to our store. Uh, and I think that was a really good selling part for us, but it also made the customers very comfortable and knowing that we were a trusting jewelry store that they knew that they were getting something of value that what they were paying for was true to what they would actually have. So for us, that um, that seemed to be a benefit, but not really too, too much. We would get into the origin of where the stones actually would come from, which mines and so on and so forth. Yeah, I didn't know how much people want to know about that or how deep you got into that. Um, yeah. Jeffrey, what about you? What, how did you educate your, your sales force um, and then what is the kind of the, the pitch you use for both? Yeah, with me, uh, we have about three people to work here and I mainly do all the custom. When you come into my store, you're mainly talking about custom. You're talking to my son or you're talking to me. So, um, you know, with me and my son, we, we have our, our feeling that we're always selling natural. When it comes to sale, the, the, using the word sell and you're using your sellability, we're selling natural. And we're selling all the providence of it, the beneficiation of it, um, our association with different cutters that we have. And we're selling on the idea of color and clarity. We're selling the idea on that every stone can be beautiful in its own right. So when we're using all of our sales ability, it's on natural. What makes that conversation go to lab is going to be price. Um, because if there's anybody saying something about the ethicalness of the stone, then we'll squash that. If they talk about the environmental concerns, then we'll squash that. So now at that point, you're only left with price. And when price is it, then we just stop it at that point. I mean, you can only educate somebody so much. You can't change them when price is their number one thing. I can't meet the price of a lab grown with a natural. No, certainly. As long as I'm selling you on natural, when the price is it, let's stop. Let's go ahead and give the customer what they want and let's meet the price they want and, and make the money that we can. So um, uh, just a quick question, Bobby, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but how did you choose your vendors? Like, how did you decide, how did you decide which lab grown companies to work with? And what was kind of like, what were you looking for when you were thinking about, okay, we're going to start carrying lab grown diamonds. Like what, what kind of things were you looking for in the company? Yeah. So the first, um, the first company that we ever used was pure grown. Um, and it was really more of, they belong to a buying group that we belong to. Um, they had a reputation that had been for a long enough time where we, with other jewelers in the industry, they were familiar with them as well. So it was really, um, when we first started and we just went with them, it was the confidence that other jewelers that we knew in the industry on top of the buying group that we belong to giving us really the, the confirmation that we needed to be like, okay. This is something that we're willing to try out. Um, we're comfortable with the company. They're easy to work with. They are reputable. And I think for us, that was something that was big because it was something for our store that was so new. We wanted to make sure that we knew what we were selling before bringing it to the public. And now, 10 years later of doing it, I do have a few other vendors that we use. Um, but same thing, it's really all from word of mouth and trusting in other jewelers in the industry, along with the buying groups that we belong to, knowing that they are ethically doing the right thing and not steering us into a bad situation. So it was word of mouth for you as well. You went with a company yeah. that you yeah. had heard other jewelers had a good experience working with. Jeffrey, what yeah. about you? Uh, when the lab grown diamonds very first came out, I wanted the same kind of like with Bobby. I wanted some that I can be secure about. And the, I went purely with Stellar. We were only using Stellar up until this year, Stellar stopped taking them in trade-in. So that's one of the things that I was able to say. People talk about there is no value. I would always tell customers, I don't know what the value in the future may be of this lab run. But what I do know is for right now, 
and I don't know how long, but I can actually let you buy a one carat and trade that in on a two carat, just like I do with natural stones. And that was only being able to work with Stellar. So I stay there. And then slowly, several of the vendors, I've been doing this since 88. So I know a lot of gentlemen who have their families are in the diamonds and they slowly started to go into uh, lab grown. And I like the idea that a person who really understood the natural market knew and how this diamond needs to look, the luster, the cut, I would like to buy them from somebody that both did also did both like I was. So that's how we've done it. I've even talked a couple of my vendors into carry lab grown because we were doing a lot. Now we're all kind of backing off a little bit, but but that's how I, I did. I was looking for a blanket also to make sure I had some way of, of um, helping a customer with there was some need after the purchase. So you obviously went with the trusted vendor that you used for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Jeffrey, you just, I'm sorry, Dave, were you going to add something? No, no, I think those are all um, very valid uh, um, kind of paths in which you find your lab grown uh, vendors. Uh, going to reputable firms is important. Again, disclosures uh, is, is the key. Uh, and that education, you know, I found it interesting, Bobby, that you said that your vendor came in with serious education to make sure that uh, all of your sales associates knew exactly uh, what they're talking about, which is so important because mm -hmm. some of the some of the research that's been done out there, uh, you know, the the mystery shopping research I've seen uh, indicated that that wasn't always the case. And, and it wasn't because somebody was being deceitful. It was because they didn't have all the information. And I think that's the key to anybody when you're selling lab grown, uh, just like any other product, because, you know, um, lab grown gemstones have been around forever. Okay. Sure. And it's a very legitimate product and it's still around today. And if you just need to know um, um, all of the attributes and what you're talking about to make sure that you pass that to your consumer. So I thought that's very valuable. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Um, so Jeffrey, you touched on this a little bit. I want to address this value issue because I think it is a very valid concern and it's a very big issue in the lab grown market right now. We've heard in some recently that some retailers are getting out of lab grown because the value is falling so sharply. So does the, two questions. Does the declining value give you pause about continuing to sell them? And number two, when you're talking about the stones, do you broach the subject of value at all with your customers? Jeffrey? Yes. Um, no, I, 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 it gives me major pause with the way that lab grown prices have failed. Um, I, I loved it when it first came out and it was a, I thought it was a nice alternative at a reasonable price, 35 back. I mean, now we're at 96, 97. There's some companies that are giving them away with the purchase of mountings. So yeah. now there is no value, All right, You're really dis discouraged on the value issue. So when value comes up, then you have to go to, to mine diamonds, right? So if you're add value, um, you're talking about uh, you know what value after the sack. I don't like to get into that. I, I know everybody says, "Oh, diamonds have value." Well, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about wanting to buy that diamond back as soon as they walk in for the same price. You know, so mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the whole idea is the value of the purchase and the fact that how important a bus purchase is to you. And when I give you all the pitch about why you want to buy the beneficial actually the the beneficial uh, aspects of it and what it's doing for people with lab grown diamonds or not. If I do all of that and still about price, then you understand you're going to accept the lack of value that you may have every year on that stone because it's it's just not holding the value. Um, if you so really you, value, you do you tell them that like yes, you're buying that. this ring today 100%. for fifteen hundred dollars, it's not going to be worth fifteen hundred dollars in a year. Hundred percent. No, you have got to be hundred percent honest. There's no reason to parse words. I mean, if, <laughs> if they're in your store, you have a chance to make a sale. I mean, don't worry about losing a sale. You, you know that's nothing to worry about give them as much honest truth because they're going to come back for you, right? I've had people who bought a lab grown diamond from me and then come back and buy natural earrings. I mean, that's when you know mm -hmm. you did the right thing by them because, you know, they felt that this purchase was okay to do lab. This next purchase was not. And because you gave them both that opportunity, you were honest with them and they understood what they were getting into. Quick question, Jeffrey, do you ever have anyone that's come in and bought a lab, went home, thought about it and come back in and said, you know what? I want to I want to go natural like I want to trade back in this diamond I'll pay the difference I want to go natural no I haven't had that but I would not be surprised to see that um the most weird one I'd have and actually just worked with him recently uh, I've a gentleman that was divorced that had a one and a half carat natural and wanted to trade that in for a three and a half carat lab 
Now that oh. I had not seen before. Mm. Actually just working with him right now. <clears throat> and um, well, we've done it a year ago and we made a mounting, did an elaborate custom mounting for him. But yeah, that was the one that I did see where it was all about size. They just wanted a bigger mm -hmm. stone. And then hey, that brings up a really interesting question that I was thinking um, during this discussion. When somebody does come in for a trade in with a diamond, how do you as a retailer um, tell that it's a mine diamond versus a natural? How do you detect? Uh, well, I have the Yehuda machine that came out several years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's the one that I use to to detect it. If it, it comes up with it's uh, um, not testing or whatever, and then I tell them that, you know, I, I can't work with the stone. Or right. I'll, I'll right. I was good to hear. So you, you, <laughs> you do something, you do one of the machines in your store and then you take it out to GAA if it can't be. Yep, right by me. I have it sitting right yes. here. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Bobby? Do you do the same? So we haven't had uh, that issue come in yet. Um, you know, I know like for the lab drones that I sell on the girdle, they're laser inscribed and it says lab drone with a certain number. So that would be the first thing that I would look for on the trade-in. But honestly, I don't have that equipment to test it myself. So if I was going to buy it over the counter, I would just be upfront with the customer and say, you know, lab drones are so readily available and used in today's market. I would really have to just check and verify first and make sure that it is a lab or a natural because obviously there's a huge difference in price. And if I'm going to be putting out money to buy something, I don't want to get beat just as much as I would right. assume the customer coming into the store buying an engagement ring would expect the same honesty from from me to them. So, so Bobby, yeah, for me, I, I don't have. To, yeah, I would send it out if if the, if the case ever came about. I would definitely send it out. Or when I go into the city, I'd bring it with me and just have someone test it for me to know beforehand. Right, more of a safe than sorry thing. Jeffrey, uh, one more question before I go to the value question with Bobby for you. Do you, ever, when you say to people, you're buying this lab grown diamond, like the prices are falling, it's not going to hold value. Does that ever dissuade anyone from purchasing? No. I mean, when they've made up their mind that they want a two carat stone, that they cannot afford a natural, um, it, it's a price issue. It's mm -hmm. a purely price issue. And they, they understand they're getting, the big question is, is that, is it a diamond? Right. Yeah. And that's the truth. I mean, in the molecular structure of this, this crystal that we've cut, it is the same. And when you're talking about diamonds, the big thing is diamonds last forever, right? So the same abrasions that it's going to be able to withstand, you're going to get that longevity of the stone. That's what they want to know. And they want to know they're going to pay the less price. The fact that it may not be worth something tomorrow, I say to keep it in your family, right? It, diamonds are not meant to be bought and then resold for a dollar amount. It's meant to be left in your family for years. And that's the reason why you buy them. Bobby, same question to you about value. Or do you bring this up when people buy lab? Do you say, just so you know, is that a, a topic you broach with your customers? Yeah, I mean, um, it doesn't come up often, but it is definitely something like Jeff was saying before. Honesty is the best policy because it's your reputation that's on the line at the end of the day. So for us, it's always, um, I've had a few people ask, and the honest answer is, I really don't know what it's going to be like in a year, five, 10 years down the road. Um, they have significantly dropped, which is concerning um, for, from a retailer standpoint, um, because, you know, you don't ever want that situation to come about where a customer comes back in five, 10 years down the road and says they want to trade this in for a larger stone or a different stone. And they find out what the value is of it at that point from when they bought it. So that's why I think it is important to tell your customers up front, listen, we don't know what the price in the market is going to be on these down the road. This is the true value to what it is today. Um, it is a diamond. It is forever. It's an engagement ring that you're giving to the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And um, there's really at that point, no much more you can do about it. Um, as an industry, I just think it's, at a point where it, something needs to happen as far as someone needs to find a way to control it. Because, I mean, to basically get these at 97, 98 back a wrap, you can't go any further once you get to 100. So at what point do you say, you know, like, this is becoming crazy? And um, do you want to keep selling them in your store? If people are still coming in, and um, like we were saying before, they're not going anywhere. I think they're going to be here for the long haul. It's really just going to come down to a matter of the industry itself, like De Beers does with mind, 
somebody's going to have to figure out a way to control the market and make it fair for everybody. Because if you go to five or 10 different vendors that are supplying lab grown, you're probably going to get all different price points. And it's really just a matter of if they are the true growers of it, or if they're getting it secondhand from a grower and they're adding their percentage markup to it. Um, but it's, it's definitely a concerning thing, but like Jeff said, and like I was saying before, honesty, always up front, tell the customer, there is no way of telling what it's going to be like down the road. The value that you're paying for today is true to what it goes for. Um, and I really feel like because the people buying the lab drones are buying so much bigger and higher in quality, there's really not much need necessarily for a trade-in, um, I mean, are you going to trade in a three carat lab grown DVS one for a six carat DVS one? I mean, I guess you could, but I, I don't see that really being something that's going to happen often for people. Um, so yeah, I think as long as you're honest, which we are, and just tell people that this is the price today, there is no telling what the price will be tomorrow or down the road. As long as you're covering your end and the customer accepts that and is understanding of that, you shouldn't be in any trouble. So Bobby, just to clarify, you do bring this up with every customer, FYI. Oh yeah. You don't yeah. know. Always. But the value. Always bring it up to them. What we're seeing yeah. now is the value is dropping. We don't know what it's going to be like in five or ten years. Totally, absolutely, yeah. And there is an argument to be made to not um, have this category compared um, in wrap or any other platform like Uni. Um, you know, it's just uh, not, it's not necessarily apples to apples uh, at all. And so when, when you hear 95 back a wrap, it doesn't make any sense. No. So there's got, there's a lot of discussion uh, in the marketplace right now about uh, other ways to evaluate um, and not use, uh, you know, these other types of uh, mechanisms where they determine average price. Um, that will, that I tend to see the market will work itself out eventually. I don't think we're any closer to that though than we were before. Mm. I think we're right in the thick of this thing right now as prices continue to drop and, and supply continues to increase. So, um, but they, but they are diamonds. So I don't like right. I don't yeah, understand right. what what other mechanism we're going to work out. How do they do <laughs> colored stones? I mean, not maybe no one on this knows, but how no. do they price per carat? Yeah, colored stones is a whole different animal. Um, I think you know, I think the future. If you look at diamonds, uh, you know there was a time when. We were just selling, you know, diamonds just based on color and clarity. Then all of a sudden, this thing came out cut, and then all we were measuring mm -hmm. cut. And then we came into a place. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the royal cut, right? We started to come up with all these different ways to di differentiate diamonds. And I think the same yeah. is going to happen. You know, blue. I mean, with um, hearts on fire, hearts on arrow. There is no hearts on fire, hearts on arrow lab grown, right? But mm -hmm. I believe that there'll be some branding and some brands yeah. off that people will yeah. slice it up and say, my lab is better because of this. My right. lab is different because of this, and then start to show a higher price for that added value. That's a good point. I mean, it, yeah, it's branding, right? That's what branding does. That's why yeah. Tiffany yeah. gets to charge, you know, it's the Robin's egg glue box. It's Tiffany. Yeah. True. Yeah. Um, we're, I wanna leave some time at the end for questions. We've had come quite a few questions come in through the chat, and we had quite a few submitted beforehand. Um, I just, I'm gonna start with a couple um, a couple sub that were submitted beforehand. Um, and Bobby, I think this is a good one for you because you mentioned having, you mentioned, so you alluded a little to how you were displaying lab and grown diamonds. So if someone wondered, you do you display side by side or in separate showcases lab grown versus natural? We separate them, yeah. Um, I don't wanna confuse my sales staff and I also don't wanna confuse the customer, there is, a difference in the two of them, mostly in the price, but yeah, so all my lab loose is in one small little section. Um, and the little bit of fashion lab that I do have, it is in the fashion um, part of my store, but it's in its own personal showcase. So they can tell and see that, okay, this is the lab grown selection. And then you have your natural and your other um, fashion pieces, but definitely 100% separate them just to take any confusion out for, the person buying and also for my salespeople so that they know, making sure they're grabbing the right piece and showing correctly. And Jeffrey, you don't keep them in your showcases. Yeah, we don't keep them in the showcase. I, I do have sample pieces that actually have cubic zirconium in the center as a sample piece, but the lab would hit, I 
usually just bring them in for somebody. If there's one here, it's because it's actually going to be made into somebody's mounting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and somebody want to, else want to know, uh, Jeffrey, I think this was going back earlier. I'm not sure this came in a while ago to the 13 to 15% um, of the market that you were discussing earlier. Somebody is asking, when referring to units sold, is that for center stone engagement rings or fashion jewelry as well, where lab grown units can be huge? Um, I think it would be in, in both at lab grown units, just because of the price. So if you look at somebody that says they sell a million dollars in lab grown diamonds, in, in the unit, that would represent 10 times the units that it would be yeah. in natural. So, you know, you just use dollar amounts and that's what we've been doing a lot of, I think in the reports I've seen in industry that they're using a whole dollar amount. But I think we really need to look at units because stores are selling units. When you look at replacing inventory, when you look at replacing diamond inventory, it's about the units. And uh, that $1 million would represent quite a few units. Yeah. Um, and then we have another question that came in before ahead of time that I thought was interesting. Are there clients who purchase both natural and lab grown diamonds? Or are they completely different clients? And that, that's, I think that's a new trend. I think that um, early on when I sold lab grown diamonds, they were going to be a lab grown diamond through and through, whether they got a bracelet, earring, a pendant, they, they liked it for whatever reason, they liked the value that they perceived they were receiving. Um, but today it's it's very different. Um, today I can easily see selling a natural diamond as an engagement ring and lab grown diamonds for Valentine's, uh, for a sweetest day, for a, a birthday. Um, but then when it comes back to an anniversary, stepping up and saying, no, I want mine diamond. Interesting. Bobby, what about in your store? Yeah, I'd say it's a mix um, with both. Um, like I said, we don't really sell too, too much in the fashion, but with my customers who are coming in and doing the engagement rings with the center stone being lab for birthdays, anniversaries, um, push gifts, they have no issue or questions with buying fashion in the natural. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little mix of both. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so um, well, someone else wanted to know, what is your average retail price for lab grown diamond bridal items and also the average carat weight of your bridal centers? In lab, we're, I mean, we're over one carat in lab. I haven't sold many but one carat and down in lab. So one and one and a half to two and a half is going to be the strong, uh, the strong number on uh, on lab stone, uh, stones. When we're doing a custom design piece. Uh, it's going to be in between somewhere around five to eight thousand on a lab that you're coming out with a one and a half carat center stone plus uh, diamonds mounting, which also have labs in it down the side. When you go natural, you know you're definitely uh, way above that. You know it's twenty thousand dollars for the center stone plus another five thousand for the mounting. Bobby, average retail price for lab grown diamond bridal uh, items, and then average carat weight of bridal centers when they're lab grown. Yeah, pretty similar to what Jeff said. Um, the customers still, I would say, anywhere from pretty wide range, but five to ten thousand dollars, and anywhere from I say minimum minimum carat and a half. But for us, the real sweet spot I would say is from like two to three carat for the center stone, um, which typically you'll see in like a eight thousand to ten thousand dollar range, including the mounting itself. Um, and that's why I think that the customers are that are buying the lab going is going that route. They have a budget in mind where they do want to spend, say, $10,000. And, you know, you go through everything in, in that $10,000 budget, they would more likely in a natural get, you know, a one carat, um, one to one and a quarter. And when you describe the lab and tell them that they could get, you know, in that same budget, a two, two and a half carat, they are, I won't say more inclined, but it's definitely something that strikes with them. They're like, hmm, I could look even better now by getting a bigger, better stone and um, higher quality and not spend more money than if I wanted to do that in the mind, I would have had to spend at least twice as much as what my original budget would have been. But yeah, I'd say five to 10,000 for the price and anywhere from a carat and a half to two and a half, three carat total weight. 
Um, I just want to make a quick observation. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of seems like Bobby, the size for you in your area is a big deal. And maybe Jeffrey, it's a little bit, it's a little bit less for you or because Bobby, it seems to me like people come in and they're like, yeah, I went bigger, I went bigger. And that might be like a New York area thing because mm -hmm. they see their friend has a two, two and a half carat. Yeah. And Jeffrey, it seems to me like maybe your consumers are looking for something a little more understated. I, I understand it would be a little much. I mean, they they still want big, but yeah, I would agree. Three to four, three and a half, you know, that we're not seeing that. Um, it's a two. It's the one and a half to two um, is, is going to be the strong suit. Um, and it's the price difference is a lot. Um, yeah. But like I say, now we're starting to see that back down. Um, and like three quarter carats, carat and a quarter, uh, one carat, um, we're doing those right now, uh, all yeah. natural. Um, mm -hmm. where that same amount of money, they know they could get a two and a half carat stone. One, they don't want that big of a stone. And two, uh, they really, really want a mine stone. Sure. Uh, we had another question just come in. Uh, one of our live listeners wants to know, using the assumption that lab grown will get so inexpensive at retail that it will be too cheap to sell, how do you protect your brand when stores are forced to compete in naturals again? Good question. And it, yeah, the question away there. When you how how are we going to compete with naturals again? Well, no, they're saying how do you protect your brand? So if you've been selling this product, that this is using this assumption that they'll be too cheap to sell. How are you protecting your brand when stores are for, forced to compete in naturals again? I mean, I, that, that gives the assumption that you're going to force feed something, right? I'm going to make a decision on what my customers want, and and that's not. So even though the question states that they'll be too cheap to sell. Um, if you have customers that are still saying, this is what I want, um, and if it's the price of your sterling jewelry, um, mm -hmm. if you sell sterling jewelry, you'll be selling this, um, you know, because I'm not dictating necessarily what I want to sell, but I'm, I'm trying to sell the best product I can at the best value I can for my customer, but I have to be dictated by what they want. I mean, if you have a customer standing there and this is what they want, they want a one and a half carat stone that now right. costs three hundred dollars, and right. you'd much rather sell a ten thousand dollars stone, but you have no option for the ten thousand dollars stone. You have to make a decision: Are you going to sell the three hundred dollar piece and hopefully sell them more, or keep them as a customer, customer and then start to maybe right. educate them and show about the beneficiation, tell them about the value of diamonds? Have you done a good enough job making your sale? You know, so, but you don't have a chance to make a sale if they're not standing in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Bobby, any thoughts on the store's brand and the store's reputation? Yeah, I think uh, Jeff nailed it on the head right there. It's, you know, at the, at the end of the day, if you have consumers that want this um, and you don't carry it because you feel like the price is so depleted that it doesn't make sense, they're going to find somewhere else to go and do it. And it could be your competitor right next door to you. I'd much rather take that sale and have a customer leave happy to tell, you know, the next 10 people that they see rather than leave my store and say, oh yeah, they didn't have anything because they felt like it was inferior to anything else that they have in the store. It's nothing more than an option to the customer. I'm not here to persuade you to buy lab or natural. Um, I'm here to supply something for you that you want. That's a need uh, for you. And um, as long as me and my salespeople have that understanding and are upfront and honest with our customers, I don't see any issues coming about. And I, I look at it the line what Bobby was saying that, that that's my line. <laughs> I do sell natural and I right. do push you a natural to the point that I don't want to make it seem like like it's a it's a, a, a lower thing to have to buy a lab. But right. I do want to walk on that line. I want to stand on as close to that line as I can to let you know, I really want you to buy a natural stone because I do find value of it. And I'd explain that value to you. Mm -hmm. Though you don't see it. Okay. Yeah. All right, come on. We're going to sell you. But understand, this is what I really I wanted you to go. So I, I like to try to stand on that line as best I can. Um, this question for both of you, if you had your choice, would you rather not not be selling lab grown at all and not have to have these conversations in this debate. Wow. I don't know. I mean, I, one of the things that I'd have to be honest about is that lab grown diamonds have given people who normally would not have quite the level of conversation or ability to purchase to get in. 
And I have seen that where a young couple that didn't want to do a quarter carrot were able to mm. step up and buy a one carrot, feel really good about it, feel good about the fact you made them feel good and are going to be customers for you for a long time. And as their, in, their increase of, of salary and, and money comes and their disposable income come, I believe they will come to us and buy a natural stone. I think because, again, I sold them on natural. They decided mm. because of dollars today to buy a lab. Right. And I think right. that if I keep them as a customer, they will turn and buy a natural stone for me one day. So I, I think it is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. is one way to look at it, right? And somebody put a comment in the chat to this to this effect. They referred to lab-grown diamonds as training wheels, which I think is a really interesting, yeah. interesting kind of metaphor. But <laughs> when you look at it in some ways, you could say, well, this is an entry point to the diamond market. And are we getting people into diamonds that before were not buying diamonds at all, that were yeah. buying handbags? A new word were... called a gateway diamond, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> new marketing, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that we're buying handbags and buying all the things that we, for so long, I mean, the discussion before lab-grown diamonds became so prevalent, for so long, the discussion in luxury and diamonds was how we were losing so much market share to other categories of luxury. So is this opening up an avenue for people to get in the diamond market, be introduced to diamonds and jewelries and make that their luxury item of choice over a handbag or something else? And then, as you said, Jeffrey, as they, you know, continue through their careers and their, their lives, they grow up they can like eventually, maybe they will be like, oh, now I can afford a natural diamond and I've been introduced and I love my diamonds and that's what I would yes. like now. Mm -hmm. no. Bobby, any thoughts on if you'd rather just not be selling them at all? I no, I mean- I um, put everyone in the spot, but I think it's it's an interesting question. No, I mean, it's it's kind of going back to the way that the price is dropping. Yeah, it's a concern and you really, maybe a headache you don't want to have to deal with, but as long as the customers are leaving happy, which is- the ultimate point of, you know, selling jewelry to people. Um, I think that everything is good and okay. Um, that's a great point Jeff made that, you know, that customer, that guy, that girl who's buying that engagement ring, they, and I've had it plenty of times where they bought the lab grown that was bigger or better quality than what they would have been able to afford in a mind. And there's a huge smile on their face and like, you know, I'm going to wow them even more when I present this ring to them than I would have before because you know a lot of times they do look at the size first that's the first thing that you notice on an engagement ring the size of the stone so if they can get away with feeling better about themselves and um you know leaving happy then I'm more than happy and willing to keep selling them and um making people in my community happy and another thing is that it's not necessarily a sales training seminar that we're doing, but, you know, never forget the level of sales that you need to do. And so don't leave money on the table. And right. I think that the lab grown diamonds, the detriment that it does to stores is leaving money on the table. It makes an easy sale at 10,000. It makes mm -hmm. it sell at 5,000. And that's not our job. If you right. see that you can get your customer to spend 30 to $40,000 on a stone, then that's your job for them. Absolutely. To cost for you. And so don't use the lab grown diamond as a cop out to make a very short sighted sales presentation. And that's what I, I say when I say I stand on the line of, of natural stones is that mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I show that added value on lab on natural stones. I show the beneficiation, you know, what we, we're doing in South Africa and the things I stand on that. Mm -hmm. because I don't want you to easily go to a lab when I know you have right. the way better. Right. Jeffrey, really quick before we wrap up, do you want to explain a little bit about what you're doing in South Africa? We were talking about it before the webinar. I thought it was pretty interesting, and I think other retailers will be interested if you don't mind. Yes, um, with Kukala Diamonds, I met a gentleman, Lebu, who has Nungu Diamonds last year at the Vegas show. We had an amazing conversation. In a very short time, we became very close friends. And I asked him, almost like because of the, the, the situation we're talking about, what is the real story on diamonds? What I mean, I know we don't have blood diamonds in our inventory. I understand the Kimberly report, but what else are, is happening with diamonds? And that's when he told me about a, a, a series of black owned companies in South Africa who, who not only buy rough, but they manufacture the rough and they sell the rough. And I, I didn't know this even exists. And so uh, we got to talking about what can we do to bring them to the United States market because they struggle to bring their diamonds to market just doing the manufacturing. And so that led to me taking a trip to South Africa and doing a presentation to the um, Diamond State Traders and to the whole group of uh, diamond factories that I went and visited every one of them. 
and amazing talented people that are doing some amazing work, but struggle to get their product to the market. And the narrative that we believe that, you know, diamonds are done in Tel Aviv or in, in um, you know, other places where you think of them being cut, they're actually being cut in South Africa. And, yeah, and Antwerp. <laughs> exactly. And so, they're, you know, South Africa is doing some amazing cutting work. So they're cutting and polishing there, Jeffrey? Oh, majorly. Yeah, major. Mm -hmm. All the companies I work with are Black African-owned companies that have all their staff and they're been yeah. cutting and polishing triple X stones yeah. uh, and giving them to the industry, but not being able to bring them directly. And that's gotcha. what I want to help them do is to help them bring their diamonds directly. And that's the Kukala uh, company that we started. But it's, it's really exciting. I mean, being in industry as long as I have to finally get to this you know, to, to the source, to what's really, you know, true and to look at these people in their face and, and they've been doing all the work that I've been selling and didn't even know <laughs> exist, you know, that's, right. that's, that's amazing. So just so everybody knows, Jeffrey and Kukala Diamonds will be exhibiting at JCK. I'm just going to do a little pitch for you, Jeffrey, at the Black and Jewelry, <laughs> Black and Jewelry Coalition's uh, collective booth at JCK. So if you want to meet him, check out these diamonds, uh, he'll be exhibiting at the shows. So just a little pitch for that, because I think it's very interesting. And I mean, if you want to talk about a beneficiation, that is true beneficiation. True. Exactly. Yeah, it's just when they say it's like, you know, don't give somebody a fish, teach them how to fish. These people have been fishing for a while and catching some great fish. Now we just need to help them sell it. And, you know, I love the idea of giving back and, and taking a piece of your profits and giving it back. But if you were to pay the people directly, you wouldn't have to give them as much, right? If these uh, individuals could grow their companies to the size that they would love to see in their vision, um, they would be able to do a lot of great things for their own country. And that's what we want to do. That's wonderful. Yeah. Jeffrey, Bobby, and David, thank you so much. It was such a great discussion today. And I apologize. We had so many questions coming through in the Q&A and some coming through in the chat. And I just, I could not, I could not get, not get to all of them. Um, uh, my next question will be back after the Las Vegas shows. Um, we're going to be live on Tuesday, June 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be myself with the other three editors that make up the National Jeweler team. And we're gonna be doing our annual Post Vegas show recap. And you could find more information about that on the National Jeweler website, nationaljeweler.com slash webinars. Um, thanks again so much to everybody who participated today and for attending. Thanks, Bobby. And, yeah, thanks, uh, Bobby. thanks Jeffrey. Thank thanks, you. Thanks guys, appreciate it. We yeah, hope you will see much. everyone in Vegas. Have a safe trip. Thank you, Michelle. Awesome. Thanks guys. And see you guys bye -bye. later, see you soon. Bye. bye, -bye. Thanks very much.